Thank you very much. It's an honor to have an opportunity to talk about the maker movement and open innovation in the United States, and then to hopefully have a conversation about what it might mean um, here in, uh, in Japan. So uh, first of all, my publisher requires that I ask you to buy my book, so please buy my book. Um, before we get uh, too started, uh, um, so I truly believe that we're in the middle of a uh, revolution. Uh, the maker movement, along with robotics, um, information technology, design technology, is enabling everybody to be able to participate in making. And this is truly revolutionary. And as a former Green Beret, I love revolutions. And I love blowing things up, like business models and doors and walls and so forth. So I'm going to ask you to help me with the presentation. Um, occasionally, I'm going to say something, and I'm going to show you some interesting projects that are actually quite revolutionary and very exciting. And so I'm going to ask you to shout, boom. Now, I'll warn you, I'll go one, two, three, and then you'll all yell boom um, in different parts throughout the presentation. So we're going to practice real quick. One, two, three, boom. Not so good. <laughs> little, little more energy. One, two, three, boom. That's better. All right, let's get started. Uh, so Tech Shop is becoming a recognized brand uh, in the makerspace. Uh, we have eight locations uh, in the U.S. right now. We have 20 projects uh, in development. I'll talk a little bit more uh, about that in a minute. Tech Shop is a membership-based, do-it-yourself fabrication workshop. What that means is for $125 a month, you can become a member of our shop and come in and use it. Do it yourself means you do it. You have access to our tools. You make the projects. You make the things that you're interested in making. We don't do it for you. And open access means anybody 16 years old or older can come in and use any tool they want in the space once we've trained them. You can be as young as 12 years old and use some of the machines unsupervised. And you can be as young as eight years old and be part of uh, an after-school type of a program. We're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We don't believe that innovators necessarily follow the clock. Just because it's midnight doesn't mean it's time to go to bed. It may mean it's time to make that project step one, uh, one step further. It takes about 1,200 square meters to um, have a full-blown tech shop. We like to say it's every tool you need to make anything on the planet. And I'm going to show you a wide array of projects. We teach hundreds of classes a month in every location. So we teach you how to use a welding machine, how to use a computer numerically controlled machine, how to use a laser cutter or a 3D printer. We do not assume that you know how to use it. We are different, though, in that we believe in DIY. So we'll give you a three-hour class on how to use a welding machine, and then you're on your own. You learn how to weld on your own. It's not a 12-week course. It's not a big certificate. It's two or three hours, how to use a machine safely, and you're off and running. And typically, it's enough to be able to move your project from where you are now to where you want it to go. We also do lots of corporate events, uh, which are a lot of fun, lasers and beer, welding and wine, water jet and whiskey, power tools and alcohol. It's a wonderful combination. And it makes for a great evening of fun and entertainment. So the types of tools we have, we have every tool you need. So machine tools, mills and lathes, computer numerically controlled machines, um, like a, a vertical mill, or a 3D printer, which is also computer numer numerically controlled. We have laser cutters. The laser cutter is easy to use, incredibly powerful, and amazingly addictive. We call it our gateway drug. So if you're a pusher in San Francisco, you always try to give them a drug that is very powerful, easy to use, and addictive. That's the laser cutter. If you don't know what it is that you want to do or you don't know what to make, we encourage you to come in and use the laser cutter because at that point, we know you're going to come in every day and spend all your money on us which is it's a great tool. We have people accidentally start businesses after learning how to use this one tool. 
We've had a homeless man who spent his last $50 on a special one month introductory and a laser cutter class, and he completely rebooted his entire life after taking that one class. It's a very useful tool. We have a complete metal shop, including sheet metal, benders, and so forth, welding, uh, MIG and TIG welding, and acetylene torches. I always recommend to my friends in the city, if you're looking for a date night, take the welding class together. It's fabulous. You get to deal with primordial fire and melted steel. It's a, it's a, great, uh, it's a great evening event. We have a water jet. This is a computer numerically controlled machine. We can teach you how to use it in two hours. It cuts through five inches thick of anything on the planet. Concrete, granite, carbon steel, cows, pigs, birthday cakes, pizza boxes. We've tried it all. It will cut through absolutely everything. And you can come in one day and the next day be making a granite countertop for your kitchen. It's a fabulous tool. The complete woodworking shop including computer numerically controlled machines. What that means is after taking two or three classes, an introduction to design using a computer, introduction to a computer numerically controlled router, you become a master woodworking craftsman. This is new to the world. You've never been able to become a master woodworking craftsman in three class sessions over a period of two days. You'll be able to produce all kinds of interesting things, and I'll talk about what some people have made to help create businesses. We have a complete plastics lab, including a, a, um, a plastics uh, molding machine, a vacuum form machine. The software is one of the key enablers. Autodesk is one of our funders. We have over a $30,000 software load from Autodesk on every single one of the computers in the space. National Instruments is also another partner. They help with the electronics. If you're working on an Internet of Things project, there's a high probability that you'll use National Instruments software and hardware. We have a textiles lab for doing um, clothing or sale, cloth or leather, commercial grade sewing machines, sergers, and actually a 12 foot long arm quilting machine. We can turn you into a master quilter in about two hours. After that class, you can download some designs and go off and quilt. We have a large project bay for doing bigger projects. I mentioned the team and group building events. They're an awful lot of fun. But what we're actually doing is building a community of the most creative people in every city that we go to. We're not really in the tool business. People get distracted by the tools because they're kind of fun and exciting and big and powerful. But that's not the important thing. What's important for us is to build a space that gets to 500 members or more so that you become two degrees of freedom from success. Because once you've aggregated the most creative people in the city across every domain, arts, electronics, um, architecture, um, mechanical engineering, electronic engineering, bioengineering, you know, burners as we call them in, in San Francisco who like to combine art and and big propane cannons that fire great big balls of fire. When you bring all of those people together and they're working on, an, on a daily basis together and you run into a problem, you go to one of our staff members, we call them dream consultants, and you ask them, I don't, I've got this problem, can you help me? And if they can't help you, which is the first degree, there is somebody on site right now who can solve that problem. That's a critical piece of open innovation. When you've created an open culture in a community where people will share their knowledge and ideas freely in this community because you've architected it correctly, it becomes one of the most powerful creative engines in a city. And we see it happen on a daily basis where somebody runs into a problem, they talk to somebody else in the space, and they solve that problem and move on to the next thing. This is what Tech Shop is. This is what a high quality maker space is. It's about the community. It's not about the tools. The tools attract the community. The community is what drives innovation and creativity. So our mission is to help drive global innovation by engaging, enabling, and empowering the creative class to build their dreams. We grow through our partner network. We no longer put up the capital to open a location. We have our partners that do that. 
So General Electric, DARPA, Arizona State University, BMW, and Autodesk have helped fund locations across the United States, in BMW's case in Munich, which we just opened um, a couple of weeks ago. I'll give you an example. Arizona State University, largest public university in the United States. They were planning on opening an innovation lab in Chandler, Arizona, and the city of Chandler had helped um, attract the capital to build or to refurbish a 40,000 square foot facility. But ASU was going to build a lab, a smaller lab than what we have, and it was only going to be available to the graduate students in the graduate master's degree in engineering. It was not going to be open to the community. It was not going to be open to the architectural school or the art school. It was not going to be open to high schoolers or junior hires. It was just going to be for the graduate students. This is normal. This is the way most universities do it. They have a lab, it's for the architectural students. They have a lab, it's for the art students. They have a lab, it's for the electrical engineering department. But we now know there are better ways of doing this. Again, this is the open innovation idea, where what you need to do is build a lab that's open to everybody. Because you want every discipline there. You want every age group there. You want every kind of entrepreneur and company that's in the community to come in and work together. And so when we shared what our vision was and what we had been doing in our locations in the Bay Area, the vice provost of ASU immediately signed on and said, no, you know what, I don't want to own a lab. I want you to own and operate the lab at Arizona State. And already we have 800 students from ASU that are using the facility, and they're using it side by side with, corporate, with companies like Intel and General Dynamics and Boeing. They're doing it side by side with junior high and um, elementary school students who are now seeing engineers that are like them doing interesting things, and it makes the kids get more interested in STEM um, education. So we grow through our partners. Fujitsu is our most recent partner. Um, we've just done a 24-foot long trailer, about is that six meters or four, four meters, and it has laser cutters and 3D printers and electronics in it, and it's now going all over the Bay Area, introducing elementary school kids and junior high kids to advanced manufacturing and helping them understand why science is so important and so practical for them that gets them excited about science. We're working on a number of other projects uh, with Fujitsu in the open innovation space. We have eight locations open today. Um, we've got 11 in development in, uh, in the United States and around the world. So we just opened Munich. We'll be opening Paris and Abu Dhabi uh, later this year. We're in active discussions with 12 more. We've got targets. So we're on track to have at least, uh, we currently have eight, we'll have at least 18 open by the end of this year. Our objective eventually is to have hundreds of them around the world. Because again, our mission is to help drive global innovation. I often get asked though, if you're into the, the, the maker movement, you get the Make magazine, and it's focused on craft projects and kind of introduction to electronics and soldering and fairly easy to do projects. And if you've been to a maker fair and you see all the little kids running around and all the interesting art people dressed in funny, interesting ways. You can get the impression that the maker movement is not about business. It's not about economic development. It's not about higher education. It's really about just fun and engagement. And that is true. The maker movement is about fun and engagement and is about the young kids and it is about craft projects. But there's a very serious side to the maker movement as well. And because our locations are so large and we have so many members, we on average have 800 members at each location. San Francisco has 1,200 members alone. We are seeing some amazing projects come out of our, our space. I'm going to go through some of them. This is the world's fastest electric motorcycle. It was built from the ground up in our Menlo Park location. They did the, the, the carbon fiber fairing. They did the aluminum frame. They milled the electric engine. They built the super bike electronic harness. They basically built everything that they couldn't get off the shelf. They had to manufacture themselves. This has got the Guinness Book and World Records for the fastest electric motorcycle. It did 200 and 18 miles an hour on the Bonneville Salt Flats. I think that was 330 kilometers an hour. It just won a major race in the United States. The second place finisher 
a Ducati monster superbike came in second. 20 seconds later. When was the last time you saw a professional race where the second place finisher came in 20 seconds later? I've never seen it in my entire life. One, two, three, boom. <laughs> Let's try that again. One, two, three, boom. All right, very good. Andy's working on a jet pack. Um, nobody else is, so Andy is. We've had three CubeSat satellites that have already launched out of the International Space Station from college projects in the um, San Jose area. This is a, uh, one of my favorites. So Max, um, his, uh, his day job after uh, going to college and getting a design degree was designing cabinets for a major retailer. Um, if you're designing cabinets for a retailer, one of the jobs of a cabinet is to be invisible because it's about the merchandise that sits on the, on the cabinet. It's not about the cabinet. So can you imagine after spending years becoming a professional des designer, your job is to be invisible? Most designers I know don't want to be invisible, and Max didn't want to be invisible either. So he wanted to open a, a light company, so he took the laser cutter class. He took the Arduino class, which is an introduction to electronics class. He's not an electronic engineer, but if you learn enough about Arduino, you can emulate what something might look like once you've uh, scaled it up. And then I ran into him and I asked him, you know, what's your plan? How are you going to get to the next stage? And he said, I'm going to go uh, do a, I'm going to launch a Kickstarter campaign and I'm going to look for $60,000. And I told Max, that's a lot of money. The average hardware Kickstarter campaign at $2,500 doesn't get funded. Half of all the hardware Kickstarter campaigns at the time he was doing it failed if they were asking for more than $2,500. Max is asking for $60,000. That puts him in the top 10% of all successful campaigns. So I was telling Max, you've got to find a way to reduce the cost. Yeah. He raised $480,000. One, two, three, boom. Quit his job, launched his company. Now he's done millions of dollars with this lamp. He took three classes and completely remade his career. He now owns a multi-million dollar lamp company. This is what it means to start a new industrial revolution where you enable creatives to be able to pursue their dreams and achieve them. Oops, in very short order. Anton is very similar. This was a uh, collapsible, well, so I, I, I run into Anton in San Francisco and he's literally standing on top of a table wrestling a 12-foot piece of plastic and, and losing. It, 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 he was not getting it to do what he wanted to do. So I went over him. He was pretty obvious he was doing something crazy. So I went over and asked him, Anton, I'm Mark, you know, what are you doing? And he tells me, I'm making a collapsible kayak. Now, you know, I'm a former corporate guy with an MBA, a um, little bit cynical, a collapsible kayak. That's a terrible idea. Why would you want a collapsible kayak? If I'm out in the San Francisco Bay, I don't want to be in a boat that collapses. I want to be in a boat that's firm. And so his description, I says, you know, Anton, I, I'm not sure about this collapsible kayak idea, but I know for a fact that you need to change what you're calling it. So you'll notice it's called Oru Kayak as an origami kayak. But again, I, I don't know, what's the, what's the size of the market for kayaks to begin with? It's not that big. What's the size of the market for kayaks that fold it's even smaller. What's the size of a market for a folding kayak from some random guy who's never made a kayak in his life? I'm not convinced. He launches a Kickstarter campaign. He's looking for about $50,000. He raises almost a half a million dollars. It turns out there's a market for collapsible kayaks. But here's what's interesting. 10 or 15 years ago, in order for him to launch this company, it would have cost him hundreds of thousands of dollars to build that prototype because he would have had to gone off and done it with someone else. He, he's too young to have assets like that. 
A bank is not going to loan him $200,000. An angel group is not going to fund a collapsible kayak company because there is no exit. Yet today, because of the combination of a makerspace where he spent like $2,000 and Kickstarter where he could gain access to a half a million dollars in capital to build them, he has launched a very successful kayak company. And 10 years ago, it wasn't possible. We are living in an entirely new era where it is possible for anybody with a great idea to prototype it and make it. One, two, three, boom. This is a dodo case, and I, I love this one. Patrick came in and asked, what classes do I need to take to learn how to make an iPad case out of bamboo and book binding? Very simple idea. It was three classes. Introduction to computer numerically controlled machines. Introduction to the computer numerically controlled router. And a textiles class where the instructor knew something about bookbinding. Patrick took these classes after being told that's what he needed to do. Within 90 days from asking the question, what classes do I need to take? He had sold a million dollars in product. 90 days. What did you do last summer? He built a multi-million dollar company and didn't even know how to use the tools when he got started. He did four million in the first year, 10 million in the second, 35 million in the third. We think he may do 60 to 100 million dollars this year. His lead user is literally the President of the United States, right there. President Obama visited a, a tech shop in Pittsburgh, and the first thing he said after introducing, he says, hi, I'm President Obama. It's like, I kind of know who you are. <laughs> you know, my name's Mark. He says, hey, my staff told me that I've got a product that was made at a tech shop. He told the Secret Service agent, go get my iPad. He grabbed his iPad, and he was showing us the iPad case. Like, this was made at uh, a tech shop. So, yeah, I know, you're in, you're in my deck. <laughs> um, but none of those ideas have changed the world. And we had a hypothesis early on that if you gave the creative class access to the tools of the Industrial Revolution, they could change the world. And these next projects have. So this is Square that came out of our Menlo Park location. The story behind the story is that they went to venture capitalists with a PowerPoint, and they didn't get funded. And then James came in to Tech Shop, built the prototype, went back out to the venture capitalist, and they got funded. If Jack Dorsey can't raise money without a prototype, how do you expect your middle managers or your entrepreneurs to start a hardware company without a prototype? You can't. If Jack Dorsey can't do it, you can't do it either. You've got to get to the prototype. What's changed is they're cheap and easy. A couple thousand dollars at the most and you can build the prototype. And that is miraculous. Uh, Phil and Bob created the world's most efficient data cooling center system. It was eventually rated by the Department of Energy as the most efficient on the globe. They beat IBM and Emerson in a head-to-head -head competition. Emerson licensed the technology. Nick and his team were ranked as one of the top five agricultural startups of the year this last year. It figures out how much fertilizer is already in the ground, so you only put enough fertilizer on saving the farmer money and saving the environment from the nitrogen runoff that comes off by over-fertilizing. Vinod Koshla, one of the top venture capitalists in the world, is one of their funders. They've raised $20 million to date. This won a Fast Company Social, Design, Social Hardware of the Year Award. Um, it's a camp stove that um, will also charge your electronics. Now, this is not so important in the first world, but in the second and third world where you have rolling brownouts and you don't know whether or not you're going to have electricity during the day, this can be a lifesaver. Trevor was another top five agricultural startup of the year award. And then my, my personal favorite, uh, Jane Chen and Naganand Murthy, coming out of the Stanford Design School, came up with an incubation blanket the idea here is there's a polymer that goes in the back that keeps this at the right temperature. Um, and it turns out, globally, 500,000 babies die every year. When they're born two weeks too early, they can't get to an incubator within an hour, they die. 
So Jane's idea was, can we extend that by another hour? And when they graduated from Stanford, they had extended it by one hour. Then magic happened. They came to Menlo Park, they interacted with the community, and a polymer chemist helped Naganon extend that one hour to four hours. So you go, okay, that's a threefold increase. Except we're dealing with geography, right? It's actually a ninefold improvement in the reach of this blanket. This blanket has saved 150,000 babies' lives. And if our makerspace didn't exist when they had graduated, this wouldn't have existed either. So let's talk a little bit more about open innovation. A couple of slides to go. So Ford came to us and said, we want you to open in, Deer in, uh, in Detroit. And we told them, no, uh, we're, we don't really want to go to Detroit. And they said, no, really, we want you to come to Detroit. We'll pay you to come to Detroit. It's like, well, that's interesting. That wasn't our business model then. That is our business model now. We'll pay you to come to Detroit. And we asked him, why would you do that? And he says, well, we have three objectives. Any one of these would pay for the entire experiment. The first one is we would like to see a 10% increase in patentable ideas coming in to tech shop or to coming into Ford. 10%, if we get a 10% increase, that'll pay for everything. If we could get one new product idea from our relationship, not even out of Detroit, but from our relationship onto the car, that'll pay for the whole idea. If you start working with our research and development community in any way so that they're more open to open innovation, that will be a huge win. So that was, those were the, any one of those would have done the trick. So the, the last one, currently the research and development community is writing us the biggest checks. In the first two years, they didn't write us a single one. Now, why? They have all the tools they need. They control all the tools. We like to say they have big boy tools. We have little mills. They have really big industrial mills. Why is the research community at Ford spending money at Tech Shop? And the answer is because in Ford, like many companies, they have a stage-gated new product development process with the assumption that this first stage, when you approve something, it's going to be incredibly expensive to build that prototype. And in many instances it is, and you need access to the really big boy tools in order to make it happen. But what they've discovered recently is in many instances they don't need to spend a million dollars and they don't need access to these big tools. And for a couple hundred dollars they can just send, us, send their people over to Tech Shop and expand their pipeline of new products coming into R&D. It's a huge win for Ford. And according to the program officer, that alone would have paid for the whole thing. There is a new product idea that came out of one of their marketing departments. Let me say that again. It came out of their marketing department. How often does marketing get to play in the research and development lab? Never. So now because they have access to a lab, they can. And they came up with an idea. And then here is the most amazing thing. We were hoping for a 10% increase we've seen a 100% increase in high quality patentable ideas coming in to Ford's patent office. A 100% increase. That's called cognitive surplus. What can you do as a manager to tap in to the extra brain power that is sitting in the desks from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. every day? And one of the ways you can do that is by enabling them to create things that they've never been able to do before. And the other example I want to give is DARPA, because it's just such a surprise. DARPA's concern was currently in the, in the United States, if you want to launch a new platform, a military platform, it's basically a $10 billion commitment, and it will take 10 years. Minimum. 10 billion in 10 years. And DARPA was going, and the, and the, the problem is that it's going, going up, and, up and to the left. Um, you know, if the current is one of those, if the current trajectory is true by 2050, um, all of the GDP will be spent on one platform. Obviously, that's not going to happen, but their question is, well, if that's not going to happen, what is going to happen? And so they came up with this idea of leveraging open innovation. So this was literally a public call. We want to build a new fighting vehicle that will work in the desert. And they open it up to anybody in the United States to compete for it. 
and all kinds of people came out of the woodworks to compete. They had three months to finish the design, 90 days, not 10 years. And then once they identified the winner, they had 90 days to build it. So what you're looking at is the final product, $1 million, six months to build a military platform. If DARPA can do it, if Ford can do it, so can your company. And that's why I think open innovation is such a critical piece of our understanding about new product development in the future. And that's it for my comments. I think we'll sit down and have a nice conversation. Thank you very much.